Story continued from Hell Creek Playlist. It is a cloudy day over the scrublands and floodplains that stretch across the landscape. Flying above these lands is the giant pterosaur, Quetzalcoatlus, seeking out viable prey as he soars effortlessly through the sky. His vast shadow sweeps over the foliage and the various dinosaurs that live here. As the intimidating flyer glides into the distance, a pair of very nervous predators poke their heads out of cover. From the undergrowth appear a duo of Acoraptor, two dromaeosaurs 2.5 meters long, covered in feathers and armed to the teeth. Though terrors to anything smaller than themselves, Acoraptor are fairly low on the food chain. Hence their first reaction to seeing the Quetzalcoatlus in the sky being to duck and cover. Now having avoided being a meal, they return to the task of finding one. Well, one that is in their size range. A good portion of Acoraptor diet is made up of feeding on the carcasses of dinosaurs brought down by much larger predators, such as T-Rex and Dakotoraptor. This pair hasn't had any luck in that regard, so are back to finding their own meals. At night, they mostly hunt mammals, as that is when they are active. During the day, it's infant dinosaurs they target. Sweeping through the ferns that surround them, they are dangerously close to a massive herbivore. Feeding on the ferns is a fully grown male Triceratops. Nine meters long and almost nine tons, he is one of the most dangerous creatures on the planet. Not just because of his size, but because of his aggression. Males can become violent with little provocation, and have been known to take out their anger by toppling trees if roused. Even so, the Acoraptor are not likely to get the monster herbivore's attention if they are quiet enough and keep their distance. So as the Triceratops feed, they slink past him. They are actually after the herds of females not far behind the male, as they have young to protect some of which may be small enough for the two carnivores to target. Moving around the foliage, the Acoraptor remain out of sight and scout the herd. The females may be slightly smaller than the nearby male, but could crush the fragile dromaeosaurs with no effort at all, so this is a very risky endeavor. There are definitely young Triceratops in the herd, but it appears all are grown to a size too large for the Acoraptor to take down quickly. Many herbivorous dinosaurs grow rapidly in their first year or two for this exact reason, to outgrow the many small predators that could feed on them. Getting a meal here doesn't seem to be an option, so the pair move into the more forested areas. Now in the late afternoon, the two Acoraptor continue to soldier on, even as the light begins to fade. They are a mated pair, their species mates for life. And though they don't have any offspring at the moment, that will change in a few months. It is especially important for the female to feed well, as soon she will have to produce and lay over a dozen eggs that the couple will dedicate a year to raising the young that hatch. They can smell that multiple mammal species have been through this way, but finding them is a little trickier, as most are so small that when they stay still, even the sharp-eyed dromaeosaurs have trouble spotting them. A rustle of leaves, however, gives one location away, making the predator's gaze snap to the sound source. Through the leaves, they spot a species of Mesodma, a rat-sized mammal out of its element on the ground. Both the Acoraptor lock onto their target and lower their bodies, ready to chase and pounce on their prey. Then a shape descends from the trees catches the Mesodma in its talons, and ascends back into the canopy. It was an Avisaurus, an eagle-like bird that preys on similar fauna to the Acoraptor, though with the added ability to fly, giving it an edge over its distant relatives. Annoyed but not able to do anything about their meal getting nabbed, the pair simply continue to hunt. Now with night having taken full effect, the pair are being extra quiet in the dark, but this is the time they prefer to hunt, as their large eyes can see almost as well under the moon as the sun. Because of this, they have located a possible meal. 
a didelphodon is foraging near the edge of a river. This 5 kg omnivore is closely related to modern marsupials, and quite large for a Cretaceous mammal. A good size for the Acoraptor. Waiting till its back is to them, the duo move forward as one, sprinting towards the didelphodon before he notices they are there. By the time he sees them, and starts to run, it is too late. The dromaeosaurs quickly close the gap, and the male leaps into the air before bringing both legs down on top of the mammal. Speared into the ground, the didelphodon squeals as the male Acoraptor's sickle claws sink into his flesh, pinning him. The female skids around the male, and thrusts her left foot forward, stomping onto the prey, and sinking in her own foot claw. It is overkill, but the two have been hunting together for several years now, and know how to bring down and secure prey quickly and efficiently. The didelphodon's cries soon die away as the predators, while still holding its body down, begin to pull at its limbs with their jaws, eating as quickly as they can. Half a minute passes, and then they hear a slight splash come from the river, only a meter away. Their lightning fast reactions are all that save them, as the head of a crocodilian bursts out of the water, jaws wide open. Each of the Acoraptor jump back in different directions, just evading the Borealisuchus's bite. A bone-crushing snap echoes through the forest as the reptile's jaws slam together, having missed his target. Out of range and at a safe distance from the croc, the Acoraptor chirp and hiss to make the intruder go back into the river. They still have half the Didelphodon's carcass to eat. It appears to work as the Borealisuchus turns around and hauls his body to the water's edge. But then the pair feels slight tremors through the ground, and here branches begin to part behind them as something big advances towards them. Looking over their shoulders, they saw the terror-inducing sight of a fully grown Tyrannosaurus Rex stomping towards them. Shrieking, the Acoraptor run up the riverbank, moving as fast as they can. But the Rex ignores them and goes for the Borealisuchus that slinks back into the river as the huge dinosaur reaches the water's edge. He doesn't stop there, and runs into the river before throwing his jaws into the water and sweeping them from side to side, trying to feel anything that he could bite down on. He feels nothing but mud. The Borealisuchus has escaped him, and the two Acoraptor are long gone, their bodies far better built for speed than his. This is the resident male who got wounded in a failed hunting attempt on a group of Edmontosaurus, his leg injury forcing him to go for anything he can, but as of yet he hasn't been able to catch anything large enough for himself and his mate, who is waiting for him at their nest. He pulls himself out of the river and shakes himself off. The longer he goes without securing a kill or finding sufficient carrion, is pushing him to make even more risky decisions in order to survive. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the thief of the underworld, Acoraptor. Acoraptor's first remains were discovered in 2009 in the US state of Montana, and was described and named in 2013. The name is derived from Acheron, the Greek word for underworld, which is a reference to the Hell Creek formation where it was discovered, and the Latin word raptor, meaning thief. It lived in North America during the Maastrichtian stage of the Late Cretaceous between 67 and 66 million years ago, right at the end of the Mesozoic Era. The holotype contains upper and lower jaw bones, plus teeth. Using this to compare it to similar sized relatives, Acoraptor is estimated to have grown to between 2 and 2.5 meters long, stood about 50 centimeters high at the hip, and weighed between 20 and 40 kilograms. Acoraptor was quickly identified as a dromaeosaur, and was originally placed in the Velociraptorinae family, which would have made it the first of this family found in North America, as Velociraptorinae are almost exclusively found in Asia. But then, a study in 2022 found that Acoraptor was a member of the Sauronophilestinae family, which makes much more sense, as Sauronophilestinidae are more well known from North America. Most interestingly, Acuraraptor's sister taxon, which is the known species it's most closely related to, is a Trociraptor, which funnily enough is also only known from jaw fragments. 
Now for those who don't know, a Trociraptor was closer inside to Acroraptor, and not the man-sized animals in Jurassic World Dominion. Why did they make them so large and use the species only known from a tip of the snout? Well, I reckon they just wanted to use the name Atrociraptor for that design. Which is kind of what they did for Velociraptor in the first Jurassic Park, but let's not get bogged down. As said before, Acroraptor and Atrociraptor are sister taxon, and seem to be quite similar in their jaw builds, being less narrow and more blunt and stocky. Sometimes called Bulldog Raptors, Theories are rising that these small, shorter-jawed dromaeosaurs were carving out a niche for themselves in the last 15 million years or so of the Cretaceous. Becoming more distinct from their Velociraptorinae cousins in Asia. But why develop this type of skull morphology? Having a shorter, thicker jaw would have made the skull stronger and better at absorbing damage, such as from struggling prey. And it is thought that a Curaraptor and friends could go after larger prey in their environments, not just small animals with no chance of fighting back. Though of course we only have the front of the jaws, but it's fair to say that they were very similar in appearance and behaviour to other dromaeosaurs, including being feathered, having long tails for balance, long arms and fingers with hook claws for grasping, and a large sickle claw on their first toe. Which brings us to the next topic. How were these dinosaurs hunting using their various weapons? Originally, it was thought that dromaeosaurs would use their sickle claw, also known as the killing claw, to slash their victims, cutting long and deep wounds across the target. Now it's known that the edges of the claws weren't serrated, and it was better at puncturing than slashing. This led to the currently most accepted theory referred to as the Raptor Prey Restraint Model, or RPR for short. This was based off the predatory behaviour of modern birds of prey. Basically, for animals smaller or lighter than themselves, a dromaeosaur would jump onto a target with its legs, and then sink its sickle claws into it to secure but not kill the prey. It would then bite quickly and repeatedly, either causing as much damage as possible or dismembering the target. The arms or wings would be used in so-called stability flapping, in order to stay secure to the target and not fall over. With more robust jaws, a Keroraptor may have had a wider range of prey than its more lightly built counterparts in Asia. Whether the rest of its body was similarly more heavily built or this was restricted to the skull isn't known. But a Keroraptor was far from top of the food chain in its environment, as it belonged to the Hell Creek Formation, home to massive animals such as Tyrannosaurus rex, Triceratops, Edmontosaurus, Ankylosaurus, and Taurosaurus. Now the Hell Creek does have a preservation bias in favour of larger animals, and we will unfortunately never know the true amount of animals or the distribution of them. But even still, a Caroraptor likely had much competition from animals closer to its size, such as Anzu, Pectinodon, Leptoceratops, and Fescolosaurus. It likely filled the niche of small predator, despite being up to three meters long. A terror of small fauna, but barely worth acknowledging by the megafauna it lived alongside. Its altered skull anatomy possibly either helped it survive in this environment against its competition, or helped it carve out a niche that other similar sized predators weren't able to. As with all of these fragmentary fossil species, I wish we could find more but theorising and comparing it to other species is half the fun of this field. And as has happened many times in the past, new discoveries help to better understand not just the species in question, but the whole ecosystem they lived in. But what do you think of Acheroraptor? And for my question of the week, do you think that the rest of Acheroraptor's body was more heavily built like its jaws were? Or do you think this was limited to the jaws and maybe a few other extremities? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.